In this episode, we're going to talk about how to tame the voices in your head. Well, at least one of them. I call mine Steve. It's one of the most common but rarely talked about problems business owners and leaders face. Welcome to the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and BuilderMasterclass.com. My name is Todd DeWalt. It's my job to help you eliminate chaos and maximize profits in your construction business. This one's going to be a little different. In this episode, we're going down the rabbit hole into one of the biggest issues that construction business owners are struggling with, but rarely talk about. It's not cash flow or selling systems, processes, profit bleeds, micromanagement, but it's actually a few levels deeper and could actually be the underlying root cause behind some of those issues. It's the voices in your head. And to be more specific, there's one particular voice in your head. This episode is sponsored by LL Flooring. LL Flooring is one of America's largest specialty retailers of hard surface flooring. They understand your floor is the foundation of a home's style, and that's why they offer over 400 floors, all at the best value, including Bella Wood hardwood floors backed by a transferable 100-year warranty. Visit one of their over 400 stores to find the right hardwood, waterproof vinyl, laminate, bamboo, or tile flooring for your style. Their flooring experts will guide you through every step of the way, from finding the perfect floor for your project to arranging safe, professional installation. LL Flooring has a variety of digital tools to help you transform your home. Use their Floor Finder tool to discover options for your project, and then use Picture It, their online visualizer, to see your new floor in your space before you install. For store locations, style advice, and more, visit llflooring.com forward slash pro. These are the floors homes are built on. LL Flooring. One other thing I want you to know about, here is part of my interview with Travis Gardner from Richmond, Virginia. Give this a listen. We have over $10,000 in pre-construction management fee that we've collected in the last month. We know that the projects we're working a price for projects that we're, uh, we're going to deliver. I, I just thought, will people pay for this? Um, and what I've now realized and what I think the masterclass got me over was explaining the value. We just decided to give a try to a, a pre-construction agreement, you know, to end the practice of free estimates. Uh, we've been doing it now for, you know, maybe a little over a month. So we don't have a lot of experience, but my experience has been far more positive than I would have imagined. If you're a builder, remodeler, or general contractor who would like to get paid for estimates, or as Travis says, end the practice of free estimates, but you have no idea what you could say to a prospect to, to get them to pay for an estimate, I put together a video for you, which you can get over at buildermasterclass.com forward slash script. It will give you three questions that you can ask that will help your prospect see the value. It'll answer the question for them, why should I pay for an estimate when everybody else does it for free? Don't send out another free estimate until you watch this video. Go to buildermasterclass.com forward slash script. Now, let's talk about this voice, and we'll start with what it sounds like. I want you to listen to this list of statements or questions and flag the ones that you've heard in your head. And I'm going to tell you about the ones that I hear most often. Here are some of the statements. Think about this list and, and listen for the ones that stand out to you as sounding familiar. This isn't going to work, so don't even bother. People don't value your ideas. You're a fraud. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're not supposed to be doing this. You should be doing something different. You should be in a different role. People don't want to listen to you. You're not a good finisher. You're not good at the details. You're not good at fill in the blank. You're going to squander your career. You'll get to the end of your career and not have anything to show for it. You screw up everything. You'll be happy when you achieve fill in the blank. This is a big myth, by the way. They don't appreciate you. Customers don't appreciate you. Your employees don't appreciate you. The boss doesn't appreciate you. Somebody doesn't appreciate what you're doing. 
They prefer somebody else, the competition. They prefer another employee. They prefer somebody else other than you. They're trying to take from you and screw you over. Have you ever heard that one before? Whether you're an employee or an employer, here's one. You don't have the gene. You don't have the personality. You don't have the training. You don't have the background. You don't have the pedigree. You don't have the education. There's something you don't have. Whatever you do, don't be vulnerable or transparent because they'll hurt you. Don't be vulnerable to your employees. Make sure you have lines between you and your customers, you and your coworkers. Don't be vulnerable or transparent. When you make a mistake, you mess that up, you're an idiot. That works for them, but it won't work for you. Here's a question. Have you ever thought about this one? Have you ever heard this question in your head? Why are those other guys successful and you're not? Why are they buying trucks? Why does it seem like they're growing and you're not? Why does it seem like they've figured it out, but you can't? What about when you are successful? Something goes well, that success you had, remember that? Well, that was a fluke. It won't happen again. Something bad is about to happen. The other shoe is about to drop. Things are going okay right now, but it can't last. Something bad's about to happen. Somebody else is more qualified than you. And then this one, you don't deserve to be wealthy or successful. So which of those statements do you hear the most? Do any of those sound familiar? You want to know which ones I hear the most? These are the ones that that run in my head, and I'm going to get to what this voice is. It's not schizophrenia, so don't worry. This is something that everybody deals with. The ones that that I hear the most personally would be, they prefer somebody else. They're trying to take from you and screw you over. You don't have the gene. You don't have the personality. I hear this one a lot. Well, that works for them, but it won't work for you. And then this constant sense of something bad is about to happen. Those are some of the things that, that I hear. Steve, as I call him. And I'll explain why I call it Steve in a few minutes. So you may want to rewind this and listen to that list again and think about what are the statements that you hear the most. And so the question is, what is that voice? And why do I call mine Steve? Well, psychologists don't call it Steve. They actually call it the inner critic. They call this voice the inner critic. This is something that most people have, maybe all people. I'm not going to say all people do. But everybody that I've worked with has it. Psychologists say most of us have it, and they call it the inner critic. And here is the paradox of the inner critic. This is why it's so problematic. This voice that is called the inner critic, it attacks and undermines you to protect you from the shame of failure. Let me say that again. Your inner critic attacks and undermines you to protect you from the shame of failure. Shame, which is sometimes called the, quote, master emotion, is the feeling that we're not worthy, we're not competent, we're not good, and that we are, in a sense, rotten at the core. Beating ourselves up, which is what the inner critic does, is a preemptive gambit to inoculate ourselves from external shaming. So all of those those statements, like... Something bad's about to happen. Um, They prefer somebody else. They don't appreciate you. You're going to mess up. People don't want to listen to you. You should be doing something else. All of these statements are a misguided effort to protect you from the shame of failure. And let me just read some of the research that I found from psychologists, people who actually know what they're talking about. I'm not a psychologist, but I, I I end up doing a lot of a lot of uh, psychology research and a lot of uh, what turns out to be counseling with my clients. And here it is. So again, beating ourselves up, what the inner critic does is a preemptive gambit to inoculate ourselves from external shaming. Sometimes the message is shame on you if you don't work really, really, really hard or shame on you if you're not tougher or smarter and better than you were last time. But sometimes the message is this, shame on you if you fail, so don't even try. Shame on you if you fail, so don't even try. 
This inner critic is self-sustaining. Imagine this. Imagine you have the most healthy, robust self-esteem of anyone you know. Then you hire an assistant who is with you all day long, eight hours a day, five, six days a week, and never ceases to criticize you. Even with this world-class self-esteem, your assistant's constant monologue about your work and your worth would eventually wear you down. And without anyone else there to defend you, which is the case when this is all playing out only in our heads, you would slowly move toward believing the negativity and criticism, regardless of whether it was true. Like a slow and steady gas leak, this toxicity would filter into the way you think, slowly poisoning your view of yourself and the world around you, likely without you even realizing it was happening. In many respects, our self-talk is no different than this hypothetical assistant. Regardless of whether the messages are true, if we listen to them for long enough, we will eventually come to believe them. The more deeply we believe something, the more likely we are to see the world through that lens of self-fulfilling prophecy. Brene Brown, who's a great author and speaker, illustrates this beautifully in her book called Braving the Wilderness, and she says this, quote, Stop walking through the world looking for confirmation that you don't belong. You will always find it because you've made that your mission. Stop scouring people's faces for evidence that you're not enough. You will always find it because you've made that your goal, end quote. So think about this. What are you going through the world looking for? What are you scouring people's faces for evidence of? As Brene Brown, she said, stop walking through the world looking for confirmation that you don't belong. Stop scouring people's faces for evidence that you're not enough. So when you're dealing with your employees, let's say you're a, you're a business owner. When you're dealing with your employees, do you have some underlying fear, this thing that you're constantly looking for? Are you afraid that they're stealing from you? Or are you afraid that they don't respect you? So you're constantly scouring their faces looking for these things? Are you mistrusting of your clients? Do you feel like a fraud and you're just waiting for them to come out and say you're that you're a fraud and they don't trust you and you have no idea what you're doing? Are you scouring your customers faces for something? Or if you're an employee, are you scouring your boss's face for something? Are you scouring the, the faces of the people around you looking for something? I know I've done this, to be honest. I've had this suspicion of something, and then I start scouring people's faces. And you know what? When I looked hard enough for it, I found it. And the same thing will happen to you. You can do this with family, employees, or direct reports if there are people that you manage on your team, customers, coworkers, your boss, subs, and vendors. What are you scouring? What are you going through the world looking for? What are you scouring people's faces for evidence of? So the danger of the inner critic is that it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you look hard enough for something. If this seed gets planted in your mind about something and the inner critic starts to say it, this assistant that has this monologue that's ever, ever going on, this incessant monologue that's going on in your head about something, you'll begin to look for it. And then when you begin to look for it, you'll begin to see it. And then it'll become, it will become this self-fulfilling prophecy. So take a few minutes. You may want to hit pause and think about what am I going through the world looking for? What is this fear that I have? What, what is the inner critic telling me to watch out for? And I'm now scouring the faces of people around me. And then we're going to get into some strategies next. So let's talk about how to manage the inner critic. And you might be thinking, well, forget about managing. How do I eliminate? How do I eradicate the inner critic? How do I shut it down? Well, I don't think you can. Psychologists say that you can't eradicate the inner critic. It's just part of, part of our makeup. Maybe it's part of the, the old limbic system part of the brain where fear resides, where the fight or flight response comes from. But psychologists agree that you can't get rid of it. So you need to manage it. It will never go away. 
and you need to understand how to manage it. So I'm gonna give you about eight strategies that I have used, that I've used with my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients and that I've learned and picked up along the way from psychologists and other experts in the field. And, and number one, and if you stop, if you only take one strategy, then please start with number one. The, just use number one. This is gratitude. This strategy of gratitude, call, it, it solves so many problems. And it's really simple. I'll give you a resource in just a moment that you can use to, uh, to go learn some more about it. But very simply, spend the first 10, maybe even just five minutes a day, and write down three things that you're grateful for at, at the beginning of every day. Three things, five minutes that you're grateful for. That's it. And you'll be amazed at what happens. If you want to do a deep dive into gratitude, one of the things that really got my attention about gratitude was a TED Talk by a guy named Sean Aker, A-C-H-O-R. If you want to watch a pretty entertaining and fascinating TED Talk on gratitude, then go check that out, Sean Aker, A-C-H-O-R, and the title is Happy, The Happy Secret to Better Work. Why is gratitude so powerful? Because it counteracts the inner critic, that inner critic, that assistant with the constant, never-ending negative monologue that's always looking at the bad, gratitude rewires your brain to look for the good things. And it, it actually physiologically rewires your brain, which you can learn more about by watching that TED Talk. So if you're going to take one strategy out of this list, then start with that one, gratitude. It'll change your life. Number two, this is one that I've, I've gone through the process of with several of my clients. When the inner critic, when fear and anxiety rears its ugly head, it's what I call catastrophizing, to catastrophize. I'm not even sure if that's a word, but that's what I call it. And that means let's go down the rabbit hole and look at the worst case scenario. So typically what happens is the inner critic says something like, that key employee, they're going to quit or that customer is going to fire you, or you're not going to get that project. You're going to run out of work. Well, okay, let's go down the rabbit hole. Let's catastrophize and look at the worst case scenario. Let's say um, if you're a business owner and you're really concerned, and the inner critic is saying things like, you know, um, Bob, your key man, or Stephanie, your key woman in your operation is going to leave. And they start saying things like, uh, the inner critic starts saying things like, looks like I'll bet they're interviewing for other jobs. I'll bet they're going to quit at the end of the year, end of the month, whatever, as soon as they get their bonus, whatever it is, this whole narrative that comes up, which is just full of mystery and intrigue. Well, the strategy of catastrophizing is to say, all right, let's go down the rabbit hole. Let's look at the worst case scenario. Let's say Bob or Stephanie quits. Then what? What would you do? What's the worst case? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? And then, well, we would have to find somebody else to take over their projects or take over their job. Okay. How would you do that? What would you do? Well, we would have to replace them. All right. Well, what would be your first step? And you would say, well, I guess I would put together a job description and I would post it on Indeed or I would reach out to my network and start looking for people. All right, then what? Then what? Just keep asking, then what would I do? Then what would I do? And think about the worst case scenario and then ask, then what would I do? Because the, the power in this strategy is that it defeats fear because fear can't live in the known world, right? Fear only lives in the unknown world. Fear and anxiety only live in the unknown world. So the best way to take the power away from fear and anxiety is to ask the question, all right, what's the worst thing that could happen? Then what? What would I do? And have a plan. So catastrophize. So if you ever find yourself thinking about what if this is going to happen or something bad is going to happen, something specific bad, specifically bad is going to happen, then remember to catastrophize. Go down the rabbit hole, look at the worst case scenario, 
and make a plan. Strategy number three is this statement that uh, I picked up somewhere. I think it may be from the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which is the antidote for anxiety is a definite decision backed by a definite plan. So strategy number three is to make a definite decision. When anxiety rears its ugly head, when the inner critic starts to tell you things and you get this that feeling in the pit of your stomach or you start to feel anxious about things, then make a definite decision. A couple of strategies that you can use. One is the Colin Powell 4070 rule. I did an episode on decision making somewhere way back, but the Colin Powell rule says it's the 4070 rule. And it says, never make a decision with less than 40% of the information you think you need, but never wait until you have more than 70% of the information you need. Somewhere between 40 and 70% of the information, when you get to that point in that sweet spot, pull the trigger, make a decision, get moving. You can course correct after you get started. But what you have to understand is that the cost of inaction, the COI, the cost of inaction of not making a decision is often much higher than the cost of making a slightly wrong decision. So the inner critic is going to say, don't make a decision until you're 100% certain. Don't offer somebody that job. Don't submit your proposal. Don't press send on that email until it's perfect, right? If we have any perfectionists listening, don't send it until it's perfect. And it's trying to protect you from the shame of criticism or the shame of failure. And when you get in that 40 to 70% sweet spot, pull the trigger, make a decision, course correct after that. If you're dealing with a big situation, then break it down. Break it into its individual components. Sometimes you have a lot of different situations going on that can be broken down into their individual components and make a plan. Break it down make a plan. Fight overwhelm. If you're feeling overwhelmed, break it down. Look at each individual situation. Make a plan. Start making decisions. Indecision is paralyzing, okay? And the inner critic loves indecision. The inner critic gets really quiet when you start making decisions. That's number three. Make a definite decision. Number four is a, it's an interesting mathematical Principle, you know, if you remember back in math class, when you subtracted a negative number, then it was essentially like adding. So in this case, it works the same way. Subtract the negatives. When you subtract the negatives, you get a positive outcome. So think about the negative things that you're putting into your head. The negative seeds that you're sowing into your mind and that the inner critic is actually feeding on. Some examples would be people, negative people, negative relationships, social media, the news. The news is a constant source of negativity. Negative information from social media, from the news. Look at what you're feeding your mind and then look for the negative sources and just subtract them. I heard a quote years ago that said, don't sow seeds and then pray it doesn't rain. So if you're dealing with anxiety and negativity and you're just not happy, then look at the seeds that you're sowing into your mind. If you're constantly watching the news, constantly watching politics, constantly looking at things that just breed negativity and fear and anxiety, Subtract those things, and you'll get a positive effect. Number five is the BHAG. I think I picked this up from Jim Collins, Good to Great, the BHAG, the Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. This will, this will actually make your inner critic flare up a little bit, but that's a good sign. It will also punch it in the face when you set a big hairy, audacious goal. There's probably no better way to punch the inner critic in the face, to punch anxiety and fear in the face, 
than to set a big, hairy, audacious goal and then go after it. Maybe it's a fitness goal. It could be a financial target. It could be a personal goal. But set big, hairy, audacious goals. Make decisions. Make plans. Move forward. Develop that muscle. Making decisions, setting goals, and executing on those goals are, it takes a set of muscles that has to be developed and practiced. Now, let's get into why I call my inner critic Steve. And the strategy to defeat the inner critic is to detach from the situation. I, I saw this quote recently that said, everything changes once we identify with being the witness to the story instead of the actor in it. Let me say that again. Everything will change once you identify with being the witness to your story instead of the actor in it. So you need to detach from the situation and realize, hey, this, this is the inner critic. This is not me talking. This is the inner critic. I call mine Steve. When that inner critic flares up and starts saying things like, hey, they prefer somebody else. They're trying to screw you over. You don't have what it takes. That works for them. It doesn't work for you. Then I say, okay, Steve, I hear you. I think of Steve, my inner critic, like an advisor, very negative advisor, very anxious advisor sitting at the table, and he's not going to shut up. I can't fire him. He's always going to be there, but he's not a great source of information. Every once in a while, his advice and his guidance could be valuable when it's tempered with some other things, but that's why I call it Steve. So you can use filter questions. Here's a good filter question to use when you have some really negative, maybe even destructive thought, like you're an idiot, you always screw everything up. Think about this filter question. Would I let somebody talk to my kid that way? Filter the things you hear in your mind and, and, and ask this question. Would I let somebody talk to my kid that way? Would I just sit back and let somebody talk to my kid that way? If the answer is no, I would never let anybody talk to my kid that way, then you're probably listening to a pretty self-destructive inner critic. And that's a good way, it's a good time to detach and say, okay, hold on, this is not me, this is something else, we've got to recognize what's going on. Here's a powerful story from a psychologist that I'd like to read for you. It goes like this. While in graduate school, I was giving, given the amazing opportunity to intern at a treatment center where one evening I was invited to observe an eating disorders group. During my first visit to the group, the group therapy agenda was set to include the reading of a letter that had been assigned to one of the group members the previous week. After discovering the extreme nature of this person's self-talk and its connection to her disordered eating, her therapist had asked her to write a letter to herself from her inner critic just as she experienced it inside her head on a daily basis. All right, so you get the picture there. This woman has an eating disorder, and the therapist said, I want you to write a letter from your inner critic to yourself just as you experience it inside your head on a daily basis. So she did that. During the next group therapy session, this woman was asked, the, the woman with the eating disorder who had written the letter, was asked to pick the person in the group whose voice sounded most like her inner critic. The friend she chose was a champ, following through on what she was asked to do, which was to read the letter aloud to her, knee to knee, in the tone in which it was clearly written. The scene was heartbreaking. Not only watching the emotional reaction of the woman who was being read to and hearing the awful things written in that letter, but also watching the friend who was tearfully reading those words of which she didn't believe a single word. The psychologist who wrote this said, although years have passed since I witnessed that scene, I still can't tell the story without tearing up. It was an incredibly powerful object lesson about what our unchecked negative self-talk can turn into and just how toxic it can be for all of us and for our relationships. So think about this. What happens if the inner critic is left unchecked for years or decades? Is it unreasonable to think that it could lead to serious problems like anxiety, depression, 
substance abuse, mental illness, suicide. Clearly, in this woman's case, it led to, or at least exacerbated, her eating disorder. That's why this is such a big deal. And in my opinion, either you're pushing the inner critic down, either you are beating your inner critic, or it's pushing you down. Either you're pushing the inner critic back, or it's pushing you back. Incredibly powerful story. So it's important for you to detach from the situation. Detach the inner critic from yourself. You may want to write a letter. You may want to write it down. And I've actually done this. I've actually written down what is bouncing around inside my head. And then when I shine the light of reality on it and I read it out loud, I think, wow, that's, that's kind, of, kind of ridiculous and, and terrible. So strategy number seven is, uh, this one's a little bit counterintuitive, but it is generosity. Get outside of yourself. Focus on other people. The inner critic is is really focused on you, and it's uh, trying to protect you from the shame of failure. And one of the best ways to push it down is to be generous and to think about others, to be others-focused others centric. So when you're thinking about, let's say, for example, growing your business, I would tell you, here's what, actually, we'll start with the inner critic. When you're thinking, you know, I I would love to grow my business. I would love to hire more people, take on more projects, bigger projects, maybe expand, increase my revenue, grow, have an impact. The inner critic immediately starts to flare up and say things like, well, you're just being selfish, um, you're greedy, money is the root of all evil, which is a misquote, by the way. And it'll say all these things, trying to protect you from the shame of failure, right? Here's, what, here's another way to think about growing your business. You're not doing it for you. Yes, you will have some benefit, but let's think about some other people. What would be the positive impact to other people of you growing your business? I would tell you that your future employees need you to grow your business. They are currently working in a place they're not happy. They don't, there's no vision. There's no leadership. It's a bad work environment. It's a bad culture. Your future employees need you to grow your business so they can come work at some place they love. Your future customers need you to grow your business. Right now, these people have to work with another builder or general contractor or remodeler. And they're stuck dealing with somebody who's not doing great work, not providing a great experience, they're not communicating, and it's just not a good experience. Your future customers need you to grow your business so they can work with you instead of having to work with the other guys. There are charitable organizations that need you to grow your business so you can support those causes. Your community needs you to grow your business so you can create jobs, so you can have a positive impact on your community, your kids, your spouse, your grandkids, your, the, your future generations need you to grow your business. So it's not about you. So when you start thinking about it that way, get outside of yourself, that's going to cause your inner critic to shut up. If you are an employee and you're thinking, wow, I want to get promoted. I would love to grow myself. I'd love to grow my leadership skills. I'd like to take on higher, higher responsibility, maybe have P&L responsibility, move up in the organization, then yes, there are some benefits to you, but start thinking things like, I want to lead people. I want to become a better leader. I need to grow myself. I need to get into a higher role. I need to move up the org chart so I can support more people, so I can mentor more people, so I can lead more people, so I can create a great environment for them. I want to serve my customers. I want to build great projects. I want to have an impact on other people. It's not just about you. This is the the essence of leadership, is you grow yourself so that you can support others. Servant leadership is the only type of leadership that works. And I would say the same thing about growing your business. So if you want to punch the inner critic in the face, Make it about others, not about yourself. And then the last one is, here is one of the, one of the most surprising and most common problems that 
construction business owners face. And this has been verified by some other folks that I've worked with who deal with hundreds of builders as well. And I've, in, I've interviewed and I have coached and spoken with hundreds of construction business owners. And one of the most common statements that I hear is, is this. I don't have anybody to talk to. I don't know if I'm doing this right. I can't talk to my competition. What it comes down to is the loneliness. Loneliness and isolation is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, root cause problems for a lot of construction business owners. And it's just by nature. You, you can't talk to your competition because you might give away a trade secret. You just feel isolated. You can't talk to your employees about these things. You can't really talk to your spouse about it. You can't, there's just nobody else that you can talk to. The only people who would understand what you're dealing with are other business owners and the only other remodeling business owners around that you can talk to, let's say, are your competition. So you, you end up, if you're not careful, you end up like Tom Hanks and Castaway talking to your volleyball named Wilson, right? Have you ever been around those people? And they just end up, because of isolation, acting like a crazy person. And we don't want to do that. So you need to be part of a community. This is one of the biggest benefits of being in some sort of trade organization. Um, if you want to take it a, a step further than just going to, say, a monthly or a quarterly meeting, then join a peer group. Join a, a mastermind group. If you're a co-construct business owner, if you, are, if you own a construction business and you're using co-construct, then there's a mastermind group available for you over at buildermasterclass.com forward slash CO group. I created a group, a peer group to fight this issue specifically for co-construct business owners and registration will be opening up again in the not too distant future, but find a peer group, find a group. Ideally, one of the benefits of the co-construct mastermind group is you'll be in a group of other people who are not your competitors, people who are doing the same type of work as you, remodeling, custom homes, general contracting. They're not working in your geography and they're doing, they're about the same size as you. They, essentially, you're going to be placed in a group. You want to be in a group, people who aren't comp your competitors, so you can be transparent and people who are dealing with the same types of problems as you, so you can share ideas. But join a peer group. There are groups out there. If you're an electrical contractor, if you're a site work contractor, if you're a concrete contractor, there are probably groups out there, but get into community. You could probably do this through Facebook groups. You can find your own, connect with people on LinkedIn, but get into some type of community. And again, if you're a co-construct business owner using co-construct software, go over to buildermasterclass.com forward slash C O group and uh, check that out. You'll get all the details on the mastermind group for co-construct users. A few other resources. If you really want to go further into this, if you're really struggling with this inner critic and you're like, yeah, wow, I realize now that the inner critic's pretty loud and it's pretty self-destructive and I don't like the path that we're headed down. I don't like the direction this is going. So check out that TED Talk by Sean Aker that I mentioned. You can Google that. Um, I'm going to put several links in the show notes on whatever podcast player you're using or if it's on YouTube. The links will be below the, the podcast or below the video. And a few things would be fear setting. Tim Ferriss, Tim Ferriss, F-E-R-R-I-S-S, has a, an interesting strategy called Fear Setting. If you're looking for a book, I, I cannot recommend this book enough. It's The War of Art, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. It's all about resistance, fighting resistance. You may be thinking, eh, I'm not an artist. Resistance shows up in the life of entrepreneurs as much as it does in artists. Anybody who wants to get better, wants to improve their station in life, will deal with resistance and the 
War of Art is a great, great book. There's another book called Your Erroneous Zones by Wayne Dyer, and one of my favorite books, maybe my all-time favorite book, Think and Grow Rich. All those links will be in the show notes. So here's my challenge for you. Here is the big question. This has been maybe an enlightening podcast episode for you, but the question is, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? You can listen to this, you can nod your head and say, yeah, wow, yeah, now I see, inner critic, yeah. And you can agree with this, but the reality is if you don't do something, if you don't implement some of these strategies, if if you don't take action, if you don't make some decisions, if you don't change your habits, then the last... 40 minutes of this podcast episode will have been a giant waste of time. It actually will probably set you back because you will have inoculated yourself and say, yeah, I get it. I get it. But you may think you get it, but you're not actually getting any benefit from it. So it's implementation time. What are you going to do next? My challenge for you would be to take a couple of minutes, hit pause right now if you want to, or as soon as this episode is over, Take a few minutes and make a decision. Do something. Is it gratitude? Is it check out the mastermind group? Is it to write a letter to yourself? Set a BHAG? Whatever it is. Is it to go buy a book? Is it to buy the War of Art or Think and Grow Rich? But take some action. Do something. Because that's the only way that anything is ever going to change for you. Do not be an information bulimic right? There's a lot of people out there who are constantly taking in information and just vomiting it back out, not getting any nutritional value from it. So take action. As I mentioned before, this episode is sponsored by LL Flooring. These are the floors homes are built on. Visit the experts at your local store or go to llflooring.com forward slash pro to learn more. And do you want to end the practice of free estimates? Remember Travis Gardner saying that? If you're a builder, remodeler, general contractor, and you want to get paid for your time, and you want to eliminate a lot of the profit bleeds that are caused by free estimates, then go to buildermasterclass.com forward slash script to get the three questions that you can ask your next prospect to get them to see the value in paying you for an estimate Don't send out another free estimate until you watch this video. That's available right now. Instant access over at buildermasterclass.com forward slash script. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Todd DeWalt. If you want to schedule a call with me to talk about putting systems in place for your business, eliminating profit bleeds, taking your business to the next level, you can go to constructionleadingedge.com. Click the red button that says schedule a free call if you're a construction business owner. I would love to talk to you, whether it's about those things, taking your business to the next level. If you want to get paid for estimates and end the practice of free estimates, I want to help you however I can. Or if you're just really struggling with something, then don't let another day, another week go by without getting some help. Go to constructionleadingedge.com. Click the red button to schedule a call with me if you're a construction business owner. I want to help you out however I can. If you get some value out of this podcast, if you could leave a rating or a review, that would mean a lot to me. I really appreciate it, and it helps get the word out there. And as always, thank you so much for listening. I will see you next time.